So today and next week, in a sense, we're taking a break from our, our current series. The reason why I want to take a break from our series today is because there is a move of God happening in our midst. Lately, we've been hearing more and more very prophetic declarations that are very specific, both on an individual and a community church level, and are undeniably of God. I mean, there are things happening right now that I just had to take a step back and be like, wow, there's stuff happening right now. We're seeing answers to prayers that were prayed years ago, that God just reserved answers for until now for whatever reason. Uh, within our leadership, we're going deeper into God's word than we really ever have in the past. There are things happening. And I believe this is a move of the Holy Spirit that we really need to recognize and understand. Because I believe the Father is calling us as individuals and as a church to higher levels of ministry. And so as we continue focusing on our vision of influence... 2018. I believe the Holy Spirit, and I'm excited to talk about this because I believe He wants us to know and understand the power of your anointing. The power of your anointing. I've never taught, I've never preached specifically about anointing in the past, though I absolutely believe it. I, I believe in the importance of it in the life of every believer, but we need to talk about it. Specifically, and see what the Word of God has to say about it, because I'm convinced that walking in the awareness and the power and the authority of your anointing is critical right now. It's absolutely essential in the season that we're in. And the more we understand and the more we exercise it, the more and more we will see the Spirit of God being poured out in exciting and undeniable ways. So let's dig in. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures today. Today's a little bit different. Normally I'll take a passage of scripture and just kind of ex just expound on it as much as I can. Today we're just going to look at a lot of different scriptures. So hang in there with me. They will all be on the screen for your convenience. Okay, but if you want to have your Bible open in digital or paper form, physical form, uh, just... We're going to go through a lot of scriptures, all right? Let's start with this one as we begin. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 says, quite simply, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Thus, all of us who know the truth of the gospel, all of us who have been saved by it, have received an anointing. Each and every one of us have received an anointing from the Holy Spirit. But what does it mean when we say someone is anointed? We've probably used that word before, or we've at least heard it before, but what does that mean when we say someone is anointed? Okay, so for most of us, we probably have a general sense of what that means. We, when we say, that's an anointed preacher, or that's an anointed worship leader, or that's an anointed teacher or counselor, whatever it is, what you're basically saying is that to some degree, this person has a particular extraordinary gifting, in, in, in a way. Right? That's what we're saying when we say that, that they're anointed. And to some degree, that's true. But that understanding can also be dangerous because then we, we, it can make us believe that in some sense that some people are more anointed than others or people are more valuable in, in the work of God than others. So it can be kind of a dangerous thing too. So we really need to understand that all of us have received an anointing. Every single one of you that knows the truth, have an anointing. Okay? So let's just make that very clear right from the start. In fact, you need to tell that to the person next to you. <laughs> just, turn, just turn to the person next to you and say, you have an anointing. Okay? <laughs> just say that. Say that. You have an anointing. You have an anointing. All right. We need to understand that. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> you have an anointing. And today we're going to look at what Scripture teaches, teaches us about what that is. And then, 
I wanted to fit it all in in one sermon, but I couldn't. So we're going to do a part two <laughs> in a few weeks, understanding the principles and how to really receive and walk in your anointing. And we're going to look at the story of Moses and the calling of Moses in Exodus 4 as we do that. And, and I've, I've been kind of reintroduced and studying Exodus 4, and it's an amazing story. So if you think you know the calling of Moses and the burning bush and, and all this stuff, there's so much to that call that we need to look at, right? So I'm excited for that too. But for today, let's really begin by just understanding what anointing is and what better place, what better person to start than with our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So let's do that. One of the most beautiful, powerful, significant examples of an anointing in Scripture is the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ as recorded in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. Now, these passages don't use the word anointing in them. But the book of Esther doesn't even talk about God. But we know God's all over that, right? Doesn't need to have the word anointing in it to teach us about anointing. I think this is one of the most incredible teachings we have in Scripture about anointing. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, describes it in this way. In those days... Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and a spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. Wow, there's so much going on here. You know, we are all good students of God's Word, amen? We're all good students of God's Word. We're not, we're not those who just read and just try to get a lesson out of it, okay? Because that's not a good student of the Word. As good students of the Word, we have to look at these passages, and we have to ask some questions about them in order for us to really dig deeper. And there's two questions that come to mind immediately for me as I'm looking at this. And the first one is why did our Lord Jesus Christ choose to be baptized by John the Baptist when John the Baptist's baptism was a baptism of repentance? There's a lot of words to simply say. <laughs> why did Jesus get baptized for repentance when he was sinless? So that's one question, right? It's a good question, right? We have to look at that. Secondly, if our Lord Jesus has always been filled with the Spirit since conception, at least in the sense of His earthly life. Why did the Spirit descend upon Him after His baptism? What was that about? Did He need more of the Holy Spirit? What was happening there? That's another good question, isn't it? We all believe that Jesus was full of the Spirit, 100% all the time. So what was this about? Well, let's talk about the first question. I have to admit, today is very theological. Okay, so just, again, just hang, hang in there with me. I don't have a lot of jokes today. I don't have <laughs> much. We're just digging deep. I and mean, we're looking deep. And we're going to look at a lot of scriptures, so... But you all love Jesus, so we're excited for that. <laughs> So the first question, remember, Jesus approaches John the Baptist that day in the Jordan River. John the Baptist says, what are you doing? I, you should be baptizing me. Why am I baptizing you? And what did Jesus tell him in response? This has to happen in order to fulfill all righteousness. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. And simply put, I believe this means that his baptism was a necessary step in the fulfillment of Jesus' atoning work on the cross. It was this foreshadowing of that. Since the righteousness of God is made available to us through the cross of Jesus Christ, in order to fulfill all righteousness, Jesus himself comes to John the Baptist within a baptism of repentance as a typology of what we would do through the righteousness of God upon us. 
In other words, he received the baptism of repentance not because he himself needed it. He did it because it was this profound act of humility. Profound act of humility. That's like Jesus coming to you. Our Lord Jesus coming to you. Say, will you pray for me? Be like, what? What are you talking about? You should be praying for me, Jesus. Why am I praying for you? That's exactly how John the Baptist felt that day. Amazing humility that Jesus had in coming to him. Because Jesus didn't want to put himself above anyone else. Any other human being that were all commanded to be baptized. It was a profound act of humility. And as I said, it was a profound act of a typology in a sense. He was showing us it would ultimately be through his sacrifice that we ourselves will be able to repent of our sin through the righteousness he makes available to us. And therefore, with this incredible scene that day, Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist, the Father declares that Jesus is the Son he loves and whose sacrifice on our behalf will be well-pleasing to the God of our salvation. There's so much happening there. And then the Holy Spirit descends upon him in that moment. That brings us to the second question. And here's where we need to make connections with other passages to realize what was happening here. Let's track this chronologically first. What did Jesus do immediately after he was baptized? Does anyone know? What happened to him right after his baptism? I'll give you a hint. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. wilderness. <laughs> right after this. The Holy Spirit descends upon him. And then Scripture says the Spirit compelled him into the wilderness. Where he would go through an intense time of fasting, <laughs> trial, temptation. It was incredibly difficult. We see snippets of it in the scriptures. But we're talking about 40 days and 40 nights of not eating anything. And at the same time, I believe the devil was just having a field day with Jesus. Every single day attacking him. And we, again, we just see a picture of it in, this, in the gospel. For those 40 days and 40 nights of him being alone. And the scripture gives us highlights of what happened. But I believe that was a very difficult, intense time Jesus had. After that, Luke 4 records that Jesus returned from the wilderness to Galilee and states that he returned in the power of the Spirit. So here we go again. This review. In his baptism, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, descends upon Jesus. Then the Spirit compels him into the wilderness. And then he returns in the power of the Spirit that empowered him throughout that entire period of time, the 40 days and 40 nights. He returns in the power of the Spirit. And what does he do after that? We're just, we're just following the, the timeline of what happened. After that, the following Sabbath, Jesus walks in to the local synagogue in Galilee, takes the scroll, and starts to read. And what does he read? He reads from Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah, and he declares this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me. Because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Therefore, I believe with all my heart that the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus during his baptism as a symbol of his anointing into ministry. He was already full of the Spirit. He didn't need more of the Spirit. He already had all of the power and all of the authority. But what he received that day was his anointing into ministry. And that's why his public ministry took place after the Spirit of God descended upon him. 
Apostle Peter declared this in Acts 10, verse 38. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. There we see that word anointed again. Anointed. And we may think, well, well, this is Jesus, though. He had a unique calling. He had a unique anointing. What did we just read at the very beginning? For you have an anointing from the Holy One as well. Yeah, Jesus' calling and his purpose and his identity as God, as a Son of God, as our Savior, of course, that is infinitely higher than anything we will ever do or call, call to be here on earth. But there's something about his anointing that God wants us to understand. It's for all of us. Let me give you uh, something outside of Scripture to, to make this point. This is getting even more kind of seminary, geeky, nerdy here. But th there's something called the Laonida New Testament lexicon. That's like the standard in biblical Greek-English studies, the Laonida. Okay? This is not some charismatic lexicon. Okay? This is not some Pentecostal lexicon. This is the lexicon that everyone who studies Greek-English uh, biblical studies uses. And I just took a screenshot of my, my digital Laonida so we could see what's, what it says, how this Greek English lexicon defines for us the Greek word for anointing, which is krio or chrisma, okay? What does it say? To assign a person to a task with the implication of supernatural sanctions, blessing, and endowment. To anoint, to assign, to appoint, assignment, or appointment. And it gives Luke 4.18, which we just read, Creo, Numa, Kurion, Et, Eme, and so on and so forth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's appointing me to preach the good news to the poor. The Greek English nerdy lexicon <laughs> says anointing is when you're supernaturally sanctioned by God to a particular assignment. And scripture says each of you have an anointing. We have an assignment. This is the biblical reality of anointing. Every single one of us has one by the Holy Spirit, to know the truth and to live out our calling and purpose. And here's the good news on top of that. When there is an anointing for a calling, God gives the promise of a fulfillment of that calling every single time. Or as Rick Warren famously says, where God guides, God provides. <laughs> he makes everything very simple and nice for us. <laughs> Where there is an anointing, God gives the promise of the fulfillment of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I told you we're going to look at a lot of scriptures today. Verses 20 through 22. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, what guaranteeing what is to come. Do you see any uncertainty there? It's not, well, 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 hopefully this will work out. Hopefully you'll be successful in what God has called you to. There is no uncertainty whatsoever. He anointed us. He's given us an anointing, an assignment that He is supernaturally empowering you to fulfill. And He's put His Spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing it will be fulfilled. God is faithful. Even as we stumble, 
Even as we fall, even as we have doubts, and even as we, 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 we mess up in the midst of this journey, even in the midst of this anointing that God has given us, what He says is that the Holy Spirit within us is like our insurance. Comprehensive coverage, no matter what happens. So the question is, are you in good hands? Right. Sorry. You had no jokes. That just killed everything right there. Sorry, Lord, I just had to <laughs> No matter what, okay, no matter what, God is faithful. No matter who you are, no matter how gifted you may or may not think of yourself to be, what God wants us to know more than anything else is you have an anointing. Each and every one of us in this room has an assignment That God has specifically given you and no one else. Now, I'm, I'm not a big fan of very individualistic kind of mentality because that's what we're kind of known for in this generation, right? But when it comes to anointing, nowhere in Scripture does it say anointing is communal. It's always something individual. Now the community is empowered as we all walk and embrace our anointing together and partner together in that anointing and, and find community and support and love in that. But your anointing is yours and no one else's. And therefore it's pointless for us to try to copy someone else's anointing. You know, some of us think, oh, I wish I could pray like her, or I wish I could lead worship like Audrey, or I wish I could preach like, you know, <laughs> Pastor Brian, you know, or, or, or just tell funny stories like Director Paul. I wish I could do things. I wish I could share my faith like, like Steve, okay, or whoever it is. You know, we, we kind of fall into that mode of, oh, well, they, they have something that, that I don't have, and I wish I had that. Well, you know what? Maybe that's their anointing, and yours is different. We can't copy someone else's anointing. You shouldn't even want the same anointing somebody else has. Because God has an anointing for you. That reminds me of a, a conversation we had with with our son this past week. We're trying to teach him about priorities <laughs> in life. As a late blooming 11 year old. And we're trying to tell him what really matters in life. This is actually pretty good. Maybe no one does. <laughs> what really matters in life are not the things that people can take from you. Meaning your iPad. <laughs> your toys, your, your stuff. People can steal that stuff. What they can't steal is your talent. They can't steal what's within you. No one can steal that. No matter how much someone paid you for it, they can't take it from you. They can't steal it from you. It's your own. Ah, oh, man. Because <laughs> that's exactly what God is saying about your anointing. It's yours. God's given it to you. He's deposited it in you. And there's a power in that. That's what I'm sensing from the Lord in this season. It's really interesting. And as I've been having conversations with various people in our church, really coming to realize that what God is doing right now, it's not this programmatic move. Where, you know, we're going to do certain things. Even last year, we, we kind of did that. We, we did various programmatic moves, going to Mexico, meeting with the other churches, trying to be very, very intentional about certain things. And that was good for that season. This season is different. I don't believe it's so much the church is going to set up activity A, B, and C, and we're just going to get involved in one of those under the guise of the church. God wants us individually to go to higher levels of ministry and the church is going to be your hub, your community, your, your, your resource 
in, in fulfilling that calling. It's like God's you know, giving visions and dreams to people, not, not to do what we used to do back in the day of thinking of outreach as, well, let's go out and, you know, uh, hand out tracts to people, or let's go out and give sandwiches to, to hungry people, which are good things. And you know, that's kind of the things we automatically think of when we think of outreach. But I, I believe God is calling us in this season to very individual, uh, based on you know the, the education He's given you and the career He's given you and certain things that God has given you or, or particular people He's put you in influence over or situations that you're in. God is, is, is kind of calling you to higher levels, thinking at higher levels, uh, levels of government and law and policy, things that like are above the, the normal realm that we think of. That's what it seems like God is doing. It's, it's something that church can't, we can't step into that as a church, but you can step into it in the anointing God has given you, and the church is behind you 110% as we do that. There's just like this higher level of stuff. I'm telling you, these conversations. It's just, it, I, I am so amazed at what God is putting on people's hearts. I'm amazed at what people are praying over us individually. Uh, it's just these very specific, powerful, prophetic declarations that God has given us. And we can't just leave that alone. You know, we can't just say, oh, that was, that's, that was great, you know, and just kind of move on with our life as, as we always have. God is, is calling us away from this sense of just doing church, right? The, the sense of just uh, living aimlessly as Christians. A lot of Christians live aimlessly. We just go about our day and our week doing what we normally do. We love Jesus. We love the church. We go to church. We go to Bible study. But there is almost this aimlessness about our lives. And Apostle Paul, he warned us about that, didn't he? He said, I don't want to live aimlessly, but I beat my body and make it my slave so I don't miss out on the calling that God has given me. He's not a boxer, you know, punching the air, he says, I am running the race. Right? There's a, it's just a different mentality, this, this shift in our mentality that God uh, is putting on our hearts. And when we embrace our anointing, we walk in that. We, uh, for today, we're running out of time, so I just want to leave us with a question. Do you really believe, do you know and do you believe that you are anointed by God. Every single one of us needs to receive that and believe it, even if you have a hard time believing that. That is the truth of Scripture. You have an anointing. Think about, has the Holy Spirit been placing in your, in, in your heart lately? Almost kind of maybe out of nowhere. A particular person or a group of people or an issue in society or a burden for a country or just anything that's kind of been stirring in your heart or your mind lately. And, and you may not even be sure where it came from. It's just something that kind of has happened. And, and you, it's undeniable. It's kind of been on the back of your mind a lot. Right? Listen carefully. The Holy Spirit as He directs you in that. Give that back of your mind thought to God. Say, God, what is this? What, what do you want me to do with this? Let's listen. He may say, Wait. I just want you to, to think about this right now. He may say, Prepare. I want you to start making preparations for this. He may say, Take the next step. Or even just go and do it. Whatever He's saying, let's just listen. And while you're listening, share that burden with others in our church community because there may be others within the community that, that are having the same thought and, and want to partner with you in that. Share it with our leadership. Share it with our leadership so our leadership can say, yeah, we want to back you up in any way we can as a church. We, we, we affirm you. We affirm that that's something God's put in your life. And, and as a leadership, just to be able to support you in that. But most of all, just pray. Dedicate yourself to the Holy Spirit. 
Give that back of your mind thought to the Holy Spirit. Give that thing that's been on your heart lately to the Holy Spirit. Ask Him, is this my anointing, God? Is this what you're calling me into? Is this what you supernaturally sanctioned me to enter? Oh man, God has these greater things, greater things He wants to do in you and through you. Don't live aimlessly. God has a purpose. An anointing is placed on you. Let's come before the Lord in prayer right now.